is related to Africa. To fighters who are tuned into our political school and hopefully understand how it is the mind of the oppressed that is the greatest weapon and artillery of the oppressor. And that's why it is so important that we gauge and engage the, the, the prescribed texts, the prescribed literature that you find within our school and also within your space because our fight is contextual and we must make sure that particularly we organize ourselves around our disposition, around our dehumanization and confront in a concentrated force this violent capitalist system. But I'll be zooming in to a more contextual matrimony of the three and how they correlate in terms of why we exist and how we exist in the space that we do. Um, what I love about Marx is that his, the, ex the existence of Marxism and, and the development of the philosophy already understood that society was interrelated, that globally we exist within a very fluid plane, whether within history or outside of history. And I love it because even the development of Marxism happened with an understanding of German philosophy, of English polit political economy, and French utopian socialism. So already he speaks to an interrelatedness of the global international space in terms of developing an outlook and analysis of the world that we exist in. So what I want to zoom into particularly is, most interestingly enough, is that our greatest understanding of the class struggle has to do with how incompatible these two factions are, which is basically the working class and the capitalist. And regardless of, of, of how the capitalist had organized itself, and which we're going to get to in a moment, I love how particularly the subject of, 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 of Marx's writing was that whether we're speaking about alienation of, of the worker, whether we're speaking about the theory of value, whether we're speaking about even how, where capitalism originates from and just the historical tendencies that found and, and, and created the kind of conditions for capitalism to, to flourish and to grow within its potential wealth. It's the fact that Marx speaks to production and in production we understand how he speaks then to commodification and how he speaks to value and how in that specific system that it is an unfair fight because the capital already within that space has economic power, one, and two, because of the social relation that we find within people's living conditions, which is what separated Marxism from Hegel. And, and this is why I struggled with Hegel a bit because Hegel spoke to an idea and the idea of capitalism and so it was dialectic, but it wasn't necessarily materialistic. And, and that is why I love Marx is, is considered to be both dialectic and materialist, because it speaks to people's social conditions. It speaks to the lived realities of people within that political process that happens because of capitalism. So what I, what we, what I want us to really, really speak about is the institutions that allow for these incompatible interests to, to one, coexist, and also for when they can't coexist, how they, they repress and dissent and how they help expand the, the, the very value that, that capitalism finds within people and from the scale of looking at chiefly from just accumulating capital and profit. So one of the things that we must understand is that, that Marx then takes us to an understanding that institutions like the state and even religion, but most specifically the state, is an instrument in the hands of the capitalist. And it's, it's, it's an institution that's used to repress dissent. It's an institution that must be part and parcel of, of making sure that globally capital manages to flex its powers, which means to consolidate a political advantage and also to make sure that it creates a framework 
for the ideology and the, the work that is needed for us to be sold the, the dream of capitalist ideology. And you find this within schools because schools and institutions of higher learning are a big part of and an instrumental part of the state. What happens when, when students try to begin to, to revolt, to speak against the commodification of, of knowledge, to speak against the, 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 even the, the worker within that space? I remember outsourcing Mas4, where students spoke to say that, no, 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 we understand the value that the worker is in that space. And particularly, we must respond to the call of saying that you can't alienate that person from their end product that has made you as an institution of higher learning to be able to charge students uh, such exorbitant fees. So that person must be humanized in this process. That person, your theory of, of, of that person's value must be adjusted and, and your outlook. So that, that was necessarily a call that a dialectic and a materialistic call by students within that space. But what happened to institutions? They militarized, which was basically what capitalism does and, and what it doesn't because they, they control the institutions. They control your, your ANC. They control the state. And what then happens is that they repress dissent. So students are uh, expelled. Students are suspended. Whatever is necessary to make sure that there is no dangerous dissent that comes from a working class that organizes itself and tries to fight within this, the, the boundaries of this unfair fight for political freedom or most, more, most appropriately within that space for value. But most interestingly enough, it's the second push towards the the ideological construct that capitalism tries to create for to condition people to accept capitalism, which is usually just a collection of, of distorted hogwash and notions that, that, that reveal that, no, 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 you guys can't think for yourselves, so we're going to help you think for yourselves. So capitalism then pushes you to acclimatize to and to assimilate to a specific culture, whether it's a, a commodified and, and, and really crass materialistic culture where in your space you'll be confronted with adverts about very, very expensive things. You'll be confronted with that, no, as, as, as this, is, this is the kind of career that you need to get to. This is, the kind, this is how you must dress. This is what you like. This is what you like to drink. This is what you like to do. This is the kind of music. This is the kind of, as, as this is, this is the kind of career that you need to get to. This is, the kind, this is how you must dress. This is what you like. This is what you like to drink. This is what you like to do. This is the kind of music. This is the kind of transport that you'd like to drive. So basically, that, that's where consumerism and specifically consumer sovereignty and the subject of consumer con sovereignty comes into play, where we're specifically saying that it's capitalism then tells you what you want. And it's in telling you what you want that ideologically and from a dialectical perspective, it's where it reinforces the ideology of capitalism and it reinforces that someone must own the factory and someone must aspire to own the bank and to, to own the property. And, and at the end of the day, someone must also be the, the, the poor, the poorly paid worker so that you can be able to get that car and you'll be able to, to live in that kind of household. And so these are the two things that basically reinforce um, the contradictions of capitalism and as much as they become greater and greater within society and harder to disguise, when it becomes too hard for them to disguise, they repress. When it becomes, maybe they, 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 repression is becoming, so they're not finding social apathy and, and social buy-in to, to repress, then they'll seek to shifting the ideological focus of people by selling them this narrative of a capitalist ideology. And which is why it's so important for us to, at a constant, always reflect within understanding the contextual end of everything in society. That at the beginning, our fight is with capitalism. And even at the end, it must always, our reflection must always be through the lens of a continual understanding that we are trying to remove every manifestation of capitalism in society.
And why it's so important that we always reflect continually on Marxism and, and use it to, to, to make political strategies is that today when you look at the, I'd say the difference between the income gaps of, of the last 100 or 200 years ago, it, it, it looks like the working class has been getting better wages or, or better working conditions. But when you look at it from the scope of even reflection as far as what the capitalists and the owners of those people who are form part of the working class and what they're taking home, you'll consequently see that the gaps are becoming greater even for them. And so very little has changed, but also, I mean, a lot has changed, but also at the same time, very little has changed from a contextual perspective, which is why we must constantly reflect and make political strategies as far as our understanding that we are fighting a very organized system. We are fighting a system that has immersed itself even within the state. So this constant look for a messiah within the state instead of organizing ourselves as the disenfranchised and the marginalized is very, very problematic. And it's one thing that we must understand why even historians, when they go back and they reflect on Marxism, it's always to say that they want to follow the rationale to show how irrational capitalism is. And that's what we must make and seek for chaos. It mustn't be our, we mustn't seek for validation from, from the state to, 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 to charge on and, and to, to fight and, and wage a class struggle. We mustn't wait for the, the, the sympathy of the government and the understanding of, of institutions, and even the institution that we learn from, even in, in, in our vice chancellors, wherever, whatever institutional structure, whatever institutional institution that exists within a state, we must understand that even in itself, it is an extension of the state and it seeks to repress dissent and it seeks to always make sure that at the end of the day, it alienates those that are truly involved in the production of that knowledge. I'll make a very serious case in point today. Graduates are sitting at home. After the school gets millions for, for okay, maybe millions is, is a bit overly exaggerated, but after the school gets a lot of money for their articles, for their journals and, and for their research, they're sitting at home, they can't be employed, they can't do anything, and, and they're waiting for the same regime of the state to help them. In fact, they're writing to government to say, assist us to, to because we, we, we're in trouble and we don't know who is responsible for our unemployment. We don't know who's responsible for, for, for even everything that we, 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 we've been so alienated from the system that we, we don't know who's responsible for it. So please assist us as the state. And that's the first problem that you're going to ask from help from a state that is knee deep in the pockets of the very capitalists that want you to be in that, that want to maintain the same social conditions, that want to maintain the same contradictions, that want to maintain the very abstract principles that which society lives by. And that is something we must constantly fight to say, no, 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 no. We must organize as ourselves and through our understanding and reflection of Marxism, constantly understand that these are things that we must understand no matter how irrational media or, or, or any institution of the state seeks to make a flight of the working class, we must understand that it is genuine and it must be waged. Which really then takes us to Leninism. And I love what comrades in my space have coined or, or call it, which is a revival of revolutionary elements of Marxism. And distinctly because it was believed to have been a step forward in terms of a application and a practical pragmatic application of Marxism in a step forward, particularly at a time where there were new conditions for capitalism and, a, and new conditions for the class struggle of the proletariat. And this was very, very important because it spoke to saying that Leninism was coined at a time and an era of imperialism and the proletarian revolution. And this is important because we understand that we are in an age of neo-imperialism. And ultimately, Lenin, Lenin didn't just restore Marxism, 
but he was able to take it a step forward in developing it within those conditions, which pushes us specifically to say, if we are to prepare for true dictatorship of the proletariat, in particular in South Africa or contextually in Africa in this time, we must understand that we must develop and prepare for a proletarian revolution and dictatorship, particularly within these conditions. And so Leninism spoke to theories and tactics of how that dictatorship was to happen and how we're supposed to look at in lens how Marxism allows us to really reflect dialectically and materialistically on immediate practical things to do within such a time. One of the greatest imprints and exceptional things that are pointed out about Leninism, which I admire most, is that it was said it was exceptionally militant and exceptionally revolutionary. And that is the character of EFF and EFF Student Command. So that is why even in terms of, of the names that you find within EFF, in terms of the culture and, 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 and most importantly, the imprint of the organization is very militant and it is very revolutionary and it speaks to an understanding of that imprint and character of Leninism. And so we understand the militancy of Leninism when we understand the three contradictions that he spoke to, particularly in the time that Leninism was conceptualized. The first one was between labor and capital. And, and it said that particularly of how the sector of, of, of capital had organized itself, it became almost an omnipotent power. And basically, even those that were charged with the responsibility, particularly parliamentary parties and the parliamentary struggle proved to be completely inadequate in freeing people from the contradictions between between the labor and capital. And basically people were at the mercy of capital because of of being sold out by revolutionary parties in, in, in parliament and, and trade unions that were no longer serving the working class, which is which is what you found particularly right now within your your current standing, your your ANC, your 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 Nehao and and such structures where they've completely placed workers and, and, and the working class at the mercy of capital and they've proved to make parliament completely a completely disingenuous sitting that has no teeth, that has no incentive to truly yield a, 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 a functional state and a functional conditioning that will free and allow the dictatorship of the proletariat. The second contradiction is the condition, the contradiction between the various financial groups and imperialist powers, and in their struggle for for resources and raw materials and foreign country and foreign territories. And this is what we saw particularly within the scrabble for for Africa, where imperialist power would move into places where there's a, a lot of raw material and. And they particularly move, whether they move within the skies of, of financial groups, of oil groups, of whatever, whatever necessary means that they move by. But basically this moved to an inevitable element of imperialist wars where people are fighting over foreign territory. And in such, you'd find that there was a mutual weakening of imperialists and the weakening position of capitalists in, gener in, in general. And this necessarily spoke to giving an advent conjecture for the proletarian revolution and practically we understood this even contextually today where we can even argue that at the advent of 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 of, of all that is happening globally where there's a, such a fight and still a scrabble for africa that it does open to a mutual weakening of imperialists particularly within the position of capitalism in general the third contradiction was the contradiction between the handful of uh, civilized ruling elite nations and a hundred million colonial and dependent people of the world. And this necessarily spoke to a killing of native intelligentsia and it, and it spoke to these countries coming exploitatively to squeeze out as much profit as they can, but in, 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 in return, 
seemingly building rails, building factories and mills and commercial centers, which inevitably were still the very things they knew they were going to use to exploit, to oppress and to squeeze out profit. So these were the kind of conditions and, and contradictions that gave birth to Leninism. And in particular, because it made in, in, imperialism instrumental in making a, a revolution practical and inevitable. And we, we must read this in the lens of South Africa and Africa right now to say that we are in that very same single knot where capital and imperialism has accelerated and facilitated revolutionary battles and ideals of the proletariat. So what we see very early from Leninism is that it was mostly concerned with arming the proletariat and particularly about coordinating, whether it was from an aspect of testing theoretical dogmas or testing the policies of the parties. But it was necessarily saying that we must heal the rift between the theory and the practice. So not only was the concern with reorganization and training and preparing the masses for revolutionary struggle, but also the introspection and self-criticism in terms of within the space of proletarian parties so that we can address the basis of their mistakes so that genuine leaders and general caters can be trained to become substantively what the revolution of the proletarian needed. But what speaks to us most about Lenin was his love for revolutionary theory, particularly when he says that without any revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement, or that a role of a, of a vanguard fighter can be fulfilled only by a fighter that is guided by the most advanced theory. It, it, it is such things that we must understand and take to heart in saying fighters must read but mostly because we admire and, and we take as, aspiration from Leninism because of this construct that we must understand the importance of revolutionary theory, not only in predicting and, and generalizing how a, a, the organization and the movement must move, but in guiding how such movement must move. The second is the criticism of the theory of spontaneity. And, and understanding the role of a vanguard with, within the movement. It was to do away and, and rehash this whole idea of, of opportunism within the labor movement at the time. And theoretically, that is something that we find that the working class has negated so long. And that is why, for the longest time, structures and regressive structures that, that like, like your Nahao, that are occupying space within the labor movement, had found so much aspirations because they, they, they had not understood and people had not understood the need of, of decidedly opposing um, the, the, this, this character and because of how unprogressive um, spontaneity is within a movement. And this is something you find particularly within a construct of people saying, no, but these are unreal demands as for things that a realizable demands or acceptable demands and and even when you look at the the war for 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 fees to fall and and particularly the call for decolonial education the end of commodified knowledge production and that the first thing that we're told is that you guys must this is not realistic it's not feasible this is this is not and that it was basically saying this is not acceptable to capitalism so come back with something better Go and try again. And and that is what we, we, we love also substantively about Leninism is that it criticized this whole idea that we must move from a revolutionary character of a working class movement and, and go and, and start speaking about what's spontaneous and what is 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 is, is acceptable and what is is realizable, what, what will get the least resistance. We must understand that functionally at the helm of a revolutionary movement and they have a, at the helm of every, a particularly in a revolutionary character of our movement, that ours is not to be deterred by what capitalism says is acceptable, is not to be moved by what the state or any, or any, or any institution that is owned by 
the capitalist and that is funded or that is a, an extension of a violent capitalist system, we must never wait for them to validate our demands. We must never wait for them to validate what we deem as acceptable, what we deem as human. And what you find particularly within EFF currently, where, when the organization is growing in other countries in Africa and we're gaining even student formations in, in, in other country in other countries outside of South Africa, is that which speaks to something that Lenin, Lenin said simply when he said the task of the revolution is to do the utmost possible in one country for the development and support and awakening of the revolution in other countries. And so as a movement, what we draw ultimately from Lenin is one, strategy and tactics as the science of leadership, particularly in the class struggle of the proletariat, the stages of the revolution and the particular strategy that worked in Russia, particularly within a, a, a such a, a, a time where imperialism was at its peak and particularly capitalism had the, the power in terms of even what it needed to maintain its power and particularly what the bourgeoisie, what they had in, in terms of even if they lost its power, what they had to fight back and wait for its power. So it speaks to us understanding the inter interrelatedness of one, the strategies of, 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 of the revolution and the strategy that allow for the flow and ebb of the movement, particularly in growing um, the working the working class movement and, and understanding how the, the plurited must in truth lead their own dictatorship. Three, the strategic how strategic leadership works, how tactical leadership works, and understanding reformism and revolution. And I think that necessarily agitates us to understand that that understand particularly when it comes to the peasant and the contradictions and the conflicts that they are constantly a constantly a part of whether it's within a country whether within it within a, a, a liberal monarchy which they exist within or whether it's within particularly a a, 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 a whole entire global village where there's an active imperial war where there's an active scrabble for, for resources, where there's an active, even concentrated effort to make sure that there, there's, an, there's, there's never a, a growth or, or, or a dictatorship of the proletariat. So it really um, drives us home. Um, there's something with that the that Lenin said um, where he was speaking to, to revolutionary parties and he was saying, that revolutionaries must complete the education. You know, they've learned to attack. Now they have to realize that this knowledge must be supplemented with knowledge on how to retreat properly. So it really speaks to understanding that Leninism was not necessarily just about analytically um, viewing the world and 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 finding and exposing the violence of capitalism and its agenda within maintaining the class project and but it was to say that leninism took it as far as disrupting status quo and making sure that pe the peasants can retain the, the, their power can re and and even further accumulated in preparation of further offense against the bourgeoisie and the capital and that speaks ultimately to where organizationally our outlook on the world is to say that even as, 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 as at the level of institutions of leading institutions of higher learning at the, at the level of of leading the state ours is not necessarily just to to disrupt the ANC not necessarily just to disrupt whiteness and, and the Stellenbosch mafia ours is not just to disrupt external western power and eastern powers that, that are scrabbling for our resources but ours is to say that after disrupting them how then do we establish ourselves so that after disrupting them they can't come back 
after disrupting them, we can continue to allow for the existence and coexistence of our people within the dictatorship of the proletariat. Which then takes us to probably my favorite philosopher and current read, um, Franz Fanon, which, and I must say this without any fear, favor, or bias, um, that as much as Fanon's contribution in terms of our understanding of decolonial thinking, of seeking and working towards a new national culture, and just the psychology of our specific disposition and the racialization of an entire human species just necessarily for their dehumanization is that I do not necessarily feel like um, and this is again without fear, favor or bias that he presented an effective political program which is something that I feel like Michael Cabral then speaks to more more accurately and how we implement racial transformation. But Fanon does give us the foundation for such work and it does give us the greatest, I would say, theoretical and literate and context, sorry, contextual contextual assessment of the psychology that influenced not only national consciousness but that spoke to the greater politics would play the right play that halted the liberation of our people particularly within the colonial project so um a lot of people have tried to rethink fanon have tried to use his work critically to not only necessarily to develop critical questions, but to connect um, critical theory and to revolutionary praxis by using his thoughts and using his texts, not necessarily just as, as filters to filter their thoughts, but as a point of departure to say, when we analyze Fanon's contribution to the deconstruction and reconstruction of national consciousness of blackness and particularly at the eve of black consciousness our thinking then must be what was Fanon's contribution as far as racism sexism colonialism capitalism and ultimately what it represents to be human and a lot of people have written um, reflections about that but that's basically how we can say we can to an extent um, use Fanon's writings to necessarily reflect and create a, 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 a new point of departure as far as reflecting where we are as an organization and as a people, particularly um, within a time of a neo-colonial society in terms of the way we've just been, we've just sought political independence, but what does it mean to be politically independent in a country that still constructs um, a prejudice around blackness, around your racial class, around what are the psychological effects of the self-construction of your blackness, of your culture and of your history. So those were the things, and I think why Fanon speaks so much to what we represent as an organization is that it it, it, it it Fanon's work, most of it, basically gives an a radical attempt to to give a psychological conceptualization of black consciousness. It, it was to specifically one recognize and give a powerful voice to the fact that you know people were looking for culture people were looking for indigenous intellectual indig like indigenous knowledge and we're looking away to shrink away from western culture because at the end of the day that's what capitalism was selling them that you know western culture is the alpha and omega of knowledge that western culture is is all and that there is no national intelligentsia there's never been 
um, indigenous intellectuals and basically you had a serious capitalist agenda because particularly when you look at the scope of countries like Africa and 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 and, and, and particularly countries where the colonial project and even apartheid when we it's specific to South Africa um, was administered one of the things that it did was that it took it took it took the class project which was these two two classes that have irreconcilable contradictions and they used race particularly to fulfill the mission of a capitalist regime that wanted to construct whatever narrative it felt necessary to really allow for a society to have dominion, particularly a class to have dominion over another class. So in trying to reimagine a new South Africa and trying to reimagine a new democracy, a new age, one of the great one of the greatest mistakes that was made at the dawn of our democracy was that there was never a true um a, a reflection i'd say about national culture and about the constructs that were made about black people within the colonial project and within apartheid there was never work done particularly by the state because we understand that a state is an extension of a capitalist system that there was never enough work necessarily to done to to do away with those with the narrative that were masquerading around uh, around what blackness meant around what historically black achievements were and so fanon though he's he's he's, he's recruited necessarily around a, a a banner of like a naive form of nativism i feel like there's a lot more complicated understand a uh, complicated understanding that people have missed about the work that Fanon does in terms of saying, you know what, there's pre-colonial and we must first address the constructs of pre-colonial Africa. We must construct and then construct a post-colonial state. And within that state, we must make a, a serious assessment of what our understanding of humanity, our understanding of, of culture and our understanding of necessarily what is not necessarily an abstract populism you know where people can believe that you know if i trace my 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 race and i trace my culture to you know i was the chief and then i masquerade within a myth to create a new elite power group no 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 no. but we're speaking to say that it was an effort a directed effort by him in order to justify a, a, a narrative that said you're not allowed to to exploit these people they're not any less than you you're not allowed to to overlook their social consciousness or to resist their liberation because they too are human they too are, 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 are your their under, your understanding of blackness is 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 is, is compromised your understanding of of nationalization is compromised and so what I love mostly about the contribution about that 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 Fanon makes is he, that he does away with like socially prejudiced class and gender formations that stood in 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 the way of true radical reform, and that's what we understand at the heart and the helm of EFF and EFF Student Command to say there's a constant program and a constant room for not only reflection but understanding that that there must be an influential contribution made by fanon's work in us understanding that we must do away with like socially prejudiced class and gender formations that stood in in, in the way of true radical reform and that's what we understand at the heart and the helm of eff and eff student command to say there's a constant program and a constant room for not only reflection but understanding that that there must be an influential contribution made by fanon's work in us understanding that we must do away with sexism with colonialism with racism 
with 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 basically with all things that that deny us our humanity particularly as a people and particularly as a fragmented left and 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 this is why the left is fragmented not necessarily because the the, the inability of the left to organize but because as we said that the capitalist regime will always seek a way to resist dangerous um resistance and that comes from the proletariate every time the proletariat tries to establish its own form of dictatorship there will be an attack and war that is done by the capitalist regime so one of that has been fragmenting us one of that has been defocusing us from an understanding of how important Fanon's contribution is distinctively to our general recourse as a country particularly where you have you still have colonial statues that are that are there that, that that are celebrated and even commemorated by our government where you still have the statues of 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 Fervut and 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 the queen in in in, in parliament where you still have streets that are named after uh, people who create grave um, genocide against black people in africa and so it speaks to an understanding that we must arise beyond um it, this 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 a liberal um national culture and this this national patriotism that we have as south africans to say that no 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 can we understand what violence the, these symbols are to black people can we understand what what we mean by the need for decolonization within the space to create our own intelligentsia can we understand the need for true self-construction that ha- happens not necessarily through the lens of of what capitalism has told us but why what we have learned about who we are and who we continuously learn to be i think in in in, in opening this thing up I, I i want this first week to to first say one the journey of reading is very very important for each person and as much as we are making these videos available for people, people must also put to task their own journeys and reflections as far as reading is concerned. Because the journey sometimes is a painful one, sometimes is an exciting one. But at the end of the day, it is you unlearning your chains. It is you unlearning and consciously identifying with a recreation of self. And that can only happen in your own personal journey. But as a final sign off, I leave you with this. When Fanon writes about violence, he particularly first explains to us that is the decolonization is a meeting of two forces opposed to each other by their very nature. And he speaks about this irreconcilable difference between the two classes as per suggested by Marx and even Lenin. That is to say the exploitation of the native by the settler was carried on by dint of a great array of bayonets and cannons. And he was speaking to the fact that the colonial rule was maintained through violence and repression, where that is structural violence, institutional violence, or it is true physical violence, but there is a constant colonized subject who's with ideas of backwardness and a lack of rationality when it comes to their own understanding of dehumanization. And even if they are to jump to a wokeness, there's always a violence that waits for them, whether it's institutional, whether it's the infrastructure, but there's always, from the point of the colonizer, there's always violence waiting to respond to them so that they can be back in submission and back to their backwardness understanding of even their own humanity. So he speaks then and he says, you know what? Violence is the ant. <laughs> um, but specifically he says... Um, the physical act of violence perpetrated by the revolutionary reminds them of their own humanity that they share with the colonizer. 
and he specifically then prescribes within that to say violence has the ability to rectify one um, where he speaks about that specifically in the preface of the Wretched of the Earth but then he also says that the native is able to cure himself of all that the, 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 colo the colonizer has thrusted him into and this is not necessarily from the ambit of, of violence but he speaks to breaking free of the mental disorder that comes as a consequence of colonial rule. And this is something that we subscribe to and understand ideologically to say that when we own Fanonism as, 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 as one of our theories, we're speaking about it from the ambit of understanding its contribution within the African spectrum to say that the organization must find identity within uh, filtering and, 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 and saying so our organization must live through the lens of Africa. One, both historically and post-colonialism. Post -colon and also that we must understand that it is through our understanding of what kind of violence what kind of, of, of therapeutic relief we want for our people. So ultimately what we take from Fanon is that as an organization, most particularly, it is very, very important of us to stand understanding that we own Fanon and its contribution from, uh, from an aspect of African theory, both from looking its outlook on pre-colonial Africa and post-colonial post -colonial state. And mostly that we must understand that this the decolonial project shall be a violent one, whether intrinsically violent to one's own humanization in the process that they shall walk in, or violent to those, to the colonizer, who tries to make us subjects in the infrastructure, in their systems and thus the importance of this organization being an organized organization militarily so and very radical in terms of our resistance it is because we understand at the helm of it all that it is only through violence that we can co-share with our colonizer in terms of humanity